Continuing from where we left off in part 1. 1 Corinthians 14 Pursue love and desire spiritual gifts, but especially that you may prophesy. For he who speaks in a tongue does not speak to men, but to God, for no one understands him. However, in the Spirit he speaks mysteries, but he who prophesies speaks edification and exhortation and comfort to men. He who speaks in a tongue edifies himself, but he who prophesies edifies the church. I wish you all spoke with tongues, but even more that you prophesied. For he who prophesies is greater than he who speaks with tongues, unless indeed he interprets that the church may receive edification. There are a couple of problems with how these verses are treated by some who hold on to the whole heavenly language belief. Starting in verse 2, this is not stating anything about a heavenly language. It is simply saying that if one speaks in a language that no one in his presence understands, he is speaking to God because God understands all languages. For example, if I am standing in a room with people who only speak English and then all of a sudden I start speaking in Spanish, I will not be speaking to the men there but to God, for only He will understand and through the Holy Spirit I would be speaking mysteries because nobody would know what I am saying. Now verses 4 and 5, Paul was rebuking the Corinthians because they were misusing the gifts and instead of using these languages to preach the gospel, they were being used in the church without being interpreted. The gifts that are given by the Holy Spirit are given for the edification of others, as we already saw in chapter 12, verse 7, where Paul says, But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one for the profit of all. Like I said before, Paul was rebuking the Corinthians because they were misusing the gift of tongues, and instead of using these languages to preach the gospel, they were being used to speak in the church even when there wasn't an interpreter. On to verse 6. But now, brethren, if I come to you speaking with tongues, what shall I profit you unless I speak to you either by revelation, by knowledge, by prophesying, or by teaching? Again, Paul is putting the emphasis on the gifts being for the profit of others. It's not to edify yourself. Even things without life, whether flute or harp, when they make a sound, unless they make a distinction in the sounds, how will it be known what is piped or played? For if the trumpet makes an uncertain sound, who will prepare for battle? So likewise you, Unless you utter by the tongue words easy to understand, how will it be known what is spoken? For you will be speaking into the air. Paul is being very clear here that what he is talking about are languages that should be easy to understand. How is one supposed to be edified if he doesn't understand what is being said? There are, it may be, so many kinds of languages in the world, and none of them is without significance. Therefore, if I do not know the meaning of the language, I shall be a foreigner to him who speaks, and he who speaks will be a foreigner to me. Here in verses 10 and 11, Paul is again making it very clear that it is earthly languages that he is talking about. In saying he would be a foreigner to him who speaks and vice versa, he's saying that there would be no understanding. Even so you, since you are zealous for spiritual gifts, let it be for the edification of the church that you seek to excel. Therefore, let him who speaks in a tongue pray that he may interpret. For if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my understanding is unfruitful. Again, all he is saying is, if he prays in a language, and he doesn't understand that language, he will not be edified. He urges the Corinthians to pray for the gift of interpretation too, so that if one is leading a prayer in a different language through the Holy Spirit in the church, all will understand what is being said and all will be edified. And when he says, my spirit prays, he is saying that it is the gift of the Holy Spirit that is enabling him to pray in different languages. His spirit would be praying in a different earthly language through the gift of the Holy Spirit. This is not talking about a heavenly language. What is the conclusion then? I will pray with the spirit and I will also pray with the understanding. I will sing with the spirit and I will also sing with the understanding. Otherwise, if you bless with the spirit, how will he who occupies the place of the uninformed say Amen at your giving of thanks, since he does not understand what you say? For you indeed give thanks well, but the other is not edified. Here Paul is making it very clear that the Corinthians were not to give thanks in a language that is not understood amongst everyone else, so that everyone can say Amen with an understanding of what they are saying Amen to. The word for uninformed here in the Greek is idiotes, which can also be translated as unlearned or illiterate. So again, further proof that there were earthly languages that could be learned and were learned at some stage in the lives of those who did not have the gift of tongues. I thank my God I speak with tongues more than you all. 
Yet in the church I would rather speak five words with my understanding that I may teach others also than ten thousand words in a tongue. Again, Paul is making it clear that it is not to be used in the church unless there is understanding for others, in other words, unless it is translated. Something that the people who believe it is a heavenly language need to think about is, if it is a heavenly language so that you can speak to God and so that the devil or any evil spirits can't understand, why would Paul demand that tongues be interpreted? That wouldn't make any sense. Wouldn't that defeat the purpose of having a heavenly language so that no one can understand unless he has the Holy Spirit? Brethren, do not be children in understanding, however in malice be babes, but in understanding be mature. In the law it is written, With men of other tongues and other lips I will speak to this people, and yet for all that they will not hear me, says the Lord. Here in verses 20 and 21, Paul is quoting Isaiah much in the same way Peter quoted Joel in Acts 2. He is quoting Isaiah to state that this prophecy from Isaiah 28 has been fulfilled. The Israelites were being preached the gospel by men in other languages. Therefore, tongues are for a sign not to those who believe, but to unbelievers. But prophesying is not for unbelievers, but for those who believe. Here Paul clearly states that tongues is not a sign for the believer, but for unbelievers. So it is not given to be a sign that you are saved. It is given as a sign to unbelievers that somebody who has not learned the language by natural means is speaking the language and is preaching the gospel by the power of the Holy Spirit. That is the sign, so that God may be glorified to the unbeliever. If it is a heavenly language that an unbeliever would have no way of understanding, how would it be assigned to him? It is assigned to him because he understands what is being said. The multitude that heard the disciples speak in their own native languages were the ones who benefited from the sign. Just as verse 22 says, tongues are for a sign to unbelievers. Therefore, if the whole church comes together in one place and all speak with tongues, and there come in those who are uninformed or unbelievers, will they not say that you are out of your mind? But if all prophesy and an unbeliever or an uninformed person comes in, he is convinced by all, he is convicted by all. And thus the secrets of his heart are revealed, and so, falling down on his face, he will worship God and report that God is truly among you. In verse 23, Paul is saying that if people come into your church and they do not speak the language that is being spoken, it won't benefit them anything because they won't understand. How is it then, brethren? Whenever you come together, each of you has a psalm, has a teaching, has a tongue, has a revelation, has an interpretation. Let all things be done for edification. If anyone speaks in a tongue, let there be two, or at the most three, each in turn, and let one interpret. But if there is no interpreter, let him keep silent in church, and let him speak to himself and to God. The Apostle Paul is stressing the importance of order in the church. There are many problems with how it is done today in some churches. First, they are not even speaking an earthly language to preach the gospel. The second problem, there is no order the way it is done today. Everyone is speaking in what they call a heavenly language at the same time. When I say everyone, I mean around 50 to 75% of the congregation. The third problem is that there is almost never any interpretation done. If it's two or three in the church doing it at the same time and there is no interpreter, it is unbiblical and clearly against the teachings of the Bible. If there is 300 people doing it at the same time with no interpreter, not only would that be unbiblical but sinful since they are being disobedient to the scriptures. And the sin of this disobedience would be on the elders of those particular churches, for they are the ones who should be leading according to biblical truth, not ignoring guidelines and commands. Back to 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 33. For God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, as in all the churches of the saints. Verse 37. If anyone thinks himself to be a prophet or spiritual, let him acknowledge that these things which I write to you are the commandments of the Lord. If you, or perhaps your pastor, thinks that what is written in Corinthians does not apply to you because you believe you are a prophet or spiritual, let him understand that these are the commandments of the Lord. As the scripture says, so it's serious, it's not a joke. God wants order in the church, not confusion and chaos. Like it says in the last verse of this chapter, Let all things be done decently and in order. If you're going to be speaking in tongues, do it as the Bible teaches. Make sure it's earthly languages. Make sure it's used as a sign to unbelievers. Make sure it is used to preach the gospel. 
Make sure it is for the edification of others. Make sure that you're not deceived into thinking that if you don't speak in tongues, a heavenly language which is not found anywhere in the Bible, that you don't have the Holy Spirit. A few more things I would like to look at before the end of this video is how we are told to pray by our Lord Jesus Christ. In Matthew chapter 6, he never spoke of some secret heavenly language that the devil doesn't know about. He tells us to pray for the Father's will to be done and not to use vain repetition. Christ teaches us to submit to the will of the Father. Heavenly Father, let your will be done. Matthew chapter 6 starting from verse 5. And when you pray, you shall not be like the hypocrites. For they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the corners of the streets, that they may be seen by men. As surely I say to you, they have their reward. But you, when you pray, go into your room, and when you have shut your door, pray to your Father who is in the secret place, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you openly. And when you pray, do not use vain repetitions, as the heathen do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. Therefore, do not be like them, for your Father knows the things you have need of before you ask Him. Christ tells us not to use vain repetitions, as the heathen do. If repeating a bunch of words and sounds is not vain repetition, I don't know what is. And He also said, Do not think you will be heard for your many words. So again, this is not the way you get closer to God by vain repetition, which is unfruitful in your understanding and does not provide edification for anyone, not even yourself. Verse 9 In this manner therefore pray, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever. Amen. So again, you are not to use vain repetition, or in other words, babbling gibberish, where you just repeat the same thing over and over again. But instead, we are to pray and worship in spirit and in truth. And God knows what you have need of before you ask Him. So let the Holy Spirit intercede on our behalf, as we read in Romans 8.26. For we do not know what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit Himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. This verse is clear. When the Holy Spirit is interceding in prayer, He does so with groanings which cannot be uttered. That means no noise. So for those who want to say that when they are speaking or praying in tongues that the Holy Spirit is interceding, please remember Romans 8 verse 26 which says that when the Holy Spirit intercedes in prayer, it intercedes with groanings which cannot be uttered. So again, without any words or noise coming from your own mouth. Now, I know a lot of people who say, I know speaking in tongues is real because of the feeling I get. Well, the truth is, many people in many different religions and practices also know that what they are practicing is real because of what they feel. Some people will claim that these are different kind of feelings and it's not like being in the Spirit or you have to experience it to understand it. Well, around three and a half years ago when I first came to Christ, I started going to a Pentecostal church and a few of them tried to help me to speak in tongues and I actually started to feel like it was truly the speaking in tongues of the Bible. I would pray in the so-called heavenly language for hours, not knowing that it had no biblical foundation. I don't want anybody doing the same as I did and as many others are still doing today, thinking that they are praying while all it is at the end is what Christ told us not to do, vain repetition. So let us not go by feelings, but by scripture. Let us test everything and hold fast to what lines up with scripture, just as great men in the Bible did, who did not go by their own feelings or understandings, but went by the word of God. Thank you for watching, take care and God bless.